Hey everyone, welcome again to another 360 Timmy Minnesota. So this week we're talking about the office. Now, where is your office? Is your office at work in the city or is your office at home? Now that's a strange question to ask, but these days it can be in both places if you're lucky enough to work from home. And uh, I do recognize we're not all lucky enough to have that option. But maybe you don't like working at home. Maybe you like the company and the interaction of the office. Maybe you're going stir crazy working at home, but maybe it's the opposite. Uh, you like working at home, the thought of getting on the tube, uh, all those crowds of people really kind of demotivates you. So I wanna explore that a bit this week. And the reason I wanna do that is because this year, more companies than ever are asking people to come back to the office um, after a period of working hybrid, as they call it, working from home and working in the office kind of loosely since the pandemic. But now there's a bit more of a focus on you must spend two days a week, three days a week, four days a week in the office. And of course, some companies have either gone blanket, you can work from home forever, and that's the decision they've made. Others have gone for, we're not doing any home working, you're in the office and you've got to be productive. And it does very much vary on, I guess, the work that you do. But what we'll do is we'll start off with an absolutely fascinating film from the late 1970s that focuses on a skyscraper in Chicago. I'm David Hoffman, filmmaker, and you're about to see a clip from a film I made back in 1976, Chicago, Illinois, The Prudential Building, a skyscraper. I got the job just to look at the building for one day. The assignment was go into this large office building, knock on people's doors, ask them if we could film them, and also behind the scenes. How does the building function at the same time as the people go to work and don't really notice much about the building? 1976, Chicago, Illinois, the Prudential Building, one day in the life of that building. A skyscraper must be tall, every inch of it tall. The force and power of altitude must be in it. It must be a proud and soaring thing, rising without a single dissenting line. Chicago architect Lewis Sullivan said that back in the 1880s, when the very idea of a skyscraper was brand new. Now there are thousands of skyscrapers, among them the Prudential Building in Chicago, a typical American office building filled with typical American office workers. Now, a lot of people say that office buildings like this don't work, that office workers feel like robots, that they're frustrated by their surroundings, and as a result, that they're unproductive and inefficient. But half of our workforce is employed in buildings like these. So if the work isn't being done here, where is it being done? Now, you can certainly see that the, uh, the, the world has changed since the late 70s. Love those shoulder pads. And of course, everyone's wearing a, a suit and tie and they're carrying a briefcase. There's not many computers on the desks and uh, there's a lot of use of telephones instead. So the world of work has certainly changed since those hazy days of the 1970s. Um, as an example, yesterday I was up at 4.30 to drive to West London to my office. Now, I tend to do a lot of meetings with people in the States, uh, in Europe and in the UK. And uh, obviously, I drove to an office to call people elsewhere. And that is often the way it sometimes works. My team are very much spread out, so we're not in one particular location. It's very difficult, really, to find a situation where we're all in one room. It probably happens two or three times a year. So technology has certainly helped us, but you'll notice looking at this film, there's a very distinct lack of computers and a big reliance on telephones. Insurance International, hold one moment. Yeah, sir, when it's Bert. No, come on, will you? For God's sake, you know, when you left here, the agreement was you'd pay me $100 a month over a nine-month period and settle the debt, correct? No interest, I didn't push you on it, I gave you a year and a half. Now, would you do me a favor and get off your ass, send me some money, or I have no choice but to see your 10-4. Yeah, yeah, right there, yeah, yeah. That's, oh, give me a 64. All the way. Yeah, all the way. One minute. Yeah, 
It's getting there with a little bit more uh, finessing. We might be able to get something out of this. Now come over on this end, Bill. Okay, hold it now. Don't get nervous. Hit the hole, Bill. Just shake it around a little bit. Release the suction. All right, bring it down, Bill. Bring it down slow. The men's washroom. The men's washroom. Uh, your best bet is the IC hey, station. These are all locked here, man. No. Coming down. Wake up, man. Now, what I also like about this film is it gives you the origins of the modern office or the skyscraper and uh, a fascinating development in steel and lifts eventually led us to the office building that we have today. Over the years, offices slowly improved as inventors came up with gadgets to make office work easier. Like the roll top desk and the typewriter. Few office buildings were higher than three or four stories in those days. But eventually, two great technological advances came together. The elevator and the steel frame. And the result was the ancestor of all modern office buildings. The home insurance building which was built in Chicago, where else, in 1885. Compared to today's giants, it wasn't much. But at the time, it was awe-inspiring. It was a skyscraper. Now, of course, the late 70s and 80s also saw the start of the computer revolution. A lot of big corporations like the campus that we've just seen on screen would have had computers uh, pretty much from that period. When I started working in the mid-90s, uh, computers on desktops were still a bit of a rarity. They were often in the corner on a trolley and they were shared between people. A bit like when I went to school, where everyone used to gather around one BBC Micro and uh, share a computer, whereas, you know, when kids today go to school, there's laptops and iPads everywhere for them to use. So very different way of working, but certainly by the early 2000s, it was unusual to find a desk that didn't have a fixed computer and uh, screen. Of course, now it tends to be a hot desk and there's a monitor there, you take your laptop in, you don't sit at the same desk every day. Very different way of working. But we're gonna look now at an office that started in the late 70s, early 80s and was really at the forefront of using technology at home and work. For most companies, this is still the office of today. An army of clerks, secretaries and typists use their skill to route messages in and out of filing systems and into the hands of managers. And there's another army of postmen who carry those messages across the country. How very different it'll be in the office of tomorrow. Command, letter, to all branch managers. Message, figures for holding account now required. My office by 1400 hours, please. Signed, Casey, Managing Director. Now, I can read that message here on my screen, and you can also read it on your screens at home. And so, too, would all my branch managers if I were simply to give the command, send. The message would be transmitted down telephone lines to all their offices, where it would appear simultaneously on all their screens. No army of clerks and secretaries, no postmen, no paper. Science fiction? Not a bit of it. Systems like this are in operation in offices all around the country at the moment. The secret ingredient, the nerve centre of this office of the future, is a machine called a word processor. Now, it's also interesting to see how businesses viewed the future of hybrid working in the year 2015. So what you have to remember is the year 2020 is when the pandemic hit. In 2015, we were looking at the new Generation Z, coming into the office and working alongside the other generations of people, and of course, how that would affect the office. And there, there was a study on the outlook of how things would develop and you know some insights into how home working would change. And they literally at this point would not have known what was coming their way in the shape of the pandemic. Wondering how your workplace will look five years from now? Kelly's Hiring Manager Report tells you all you need to know to prepare for the 2020 workplace as an employer. The opinions of over 2,000 managers with hiring responsibilities across EMEA and APAC regions have been collected to give you a more accurate view of the future. We uncover how the 2020 workplace will really look. 
52% expect to see a rise in multiple generations and nationalities. 55% expect to see more workplace flexibility and 46% predict a rise in virtual or mobile teams. Now, certainly my own views on the hybrid are interesting. So I've been a home and, and office worker since before the pandemic. When I, when I first started work, I was in the office nine to five. I never worked from home ever for years and years and years. Then it became um, a thing when I worked for an organization where my local site closed. So I had to work from home permanently. I, I luckily at that time worked with a colleague who would come to my house or we, I'd go to his and we'd kind of work um, side by side most days like that. Uh, when that ended, I went to work in a corporate office uh, where I was out and about all the time, uh, not much home working. And then I think there was a particular period where I thought I'm spending thousands of pounds on the season ticket. I wouldn't mind trying driving in a couple of days a week working from home. So I did a little bit of an experiment myself in terms of how much I could save on travel because I had to get a season ticket uh, for seven days a week when I wasn't going to London seven days a week. And I really thought, well, that's a bit of a waste of money. And uh, how could I do this better? And I did save myself an awful lot doing that. Um, and of course, that's what we all found out when, when the pandemic came along. So suddenly those season tickets weren't required. We had, as you remember, a couple of lockdowns where um, we started to get back to normal, then we were locked down again. So home working was just really a mandatory thing for quite a, a period of time. And then there was a bit of nervousness about coming back to the office when we had the spikes and resurgence in the in the uh, virus. Um, so really changed everyone's point of view. And of course, over the last two to three years, people have actually seen fairly significant savings on travel costs. Um, you know, you can, you can argue, of course, that you're using more electricity at home and all that kind of stuff. It really doesn't equate to thousands of pounds for a season ticket. And uh, that's obviously the key thing here. And of course, in balance of asking people come, to come back to the office, that's something they're going to have to kind of wrestle with as well, because, you know, it's important to think about the supporting services that go on out there, not just the building you're in. The building that you're in, as you saw from that documentary earlier, has security guards, maintenance teams, catering staff, cleaning staff. Their livelihoods are all reliant on you going to the office. So there's got to be a balance to be struck. But there's also things like the tube, the train, the buses, the taxis, the coffee shops, again, supporting industries that rely on us going to work in the office and finding a a balance between the two. Now you can see in this film where there's a bit of use of AI and augmented reality, how your working week could look and your decision paths all based upon what the AI is um, asking you to do or, or giving you options to do. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Amy. Where would you like to work today? The office. What's the weather like today? The temperature is 18 degrees with a 57% chance of rain. Are you ready to start your day? Uh, give me 10 minutes. OK. How would you like to get there? I'll walk. Do you want to ride? No, I'm good. Thank you. Careful, Amy. Obstacle ahead. Nearly there. Good time, Amy. No. Your coffee will be ready in five, four, three, two, one. Thank you. Tip sent. Now, I don't think that's actually far away. Obviously, the uh, ability to see things in, in plain sight in front of you, you're not going to be walking around with an Apple Vision. We've already covered that in an episode. Um, but uh, when you, you literally can have a working day like that where uh, it, it plots things out for you. I guess we, we've lost something, haven't we, really, when uh, we can't decide whether we want a coffee or not or whether to meet so-and-so or, or take this particular route. We're, we're going to get very dumb if we're controlled by computers to that level. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, rather interesting. I think I mentioned earlier my thoughts on hybrid. Now, one of the things I will say is that during the lockdown, I was luckily in work. I wasn't furloughed like a lot of people were and it wasn't a tough time for me. 
it was in terms of uh, personally understanding how things were going to develop and making sure all my team were okay. That was kind of that was incredibly important, and obviously we didn't really see the end to it. But what we did have was a very major project that we worked on during the lockdown. I don't think anyone would have thought we could have got done in normal times, let alone when you have people that can't go out and install equipment. We can't get things from suppliers because the whole world was kind of going into a, 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 a spin and all the lead times for kit was getting longer and longer. And we had all troubles with the Suez Canal just before, which had blockaded lots of um, product getting around the world. But we did actually deliver two major projects during the lockdown. So it kind of showed working from home can be done very well. I mentioned earlier that sometimes though, you, you think about commuting to the office, you're possibly doing two to four hours of travel, um, two hours there, two hours back or, or something similar in terms of either catching the train or driving. But also on the flip side, if you're working from home, sometimes I can get up at seven, um, get straight into this chair and I don't get out of it until seven in the evening. And I've not had a break. I've just been in front of this computer and to talk to anybody, I have to, have to call them or I have to have a scheduled meeting. Whereas I can't just go, oh, fancy going out for lunch. Oh, fancy a coffee. Those kind of interactions are gone. So there's a, there's a balance to be struck, I'm sure. And obviously during the pandemic, some people that thought they could never work from home uh, there was ways and means of that happening. And it's quite universal now, particularly in my industry in TV. Uh, a lot of the work is on-site production. So obviously that had to remain on-site, but you'd be surprised how many things can be remotely done these days. And uh, the technology certainly allowed us to do it. I've noticed a change. Before the pandemic, we certainly had a lot of audio calls. We were always hopping on. You'd very rarely see people on any video calls. Post-pandemic, things like Teams, Zoom, Google Google Hangouts. Everyone's now using video. You're seeing people at home, you're seeing people in the office, you're seeing collaboration on whiteboards. It's not that daft, really. I mean, again, taking my particular role, I'm often on the phone with people in the US or in Europe. I'm never actually ever talking to a team of people who are in one particular site these days. And we have had, of course, some high profile companies like Apple who have moved to a billion dollar headquarters and found their staff didn't want to come back to the office. And um, they've had to really sort of work out how to get them back in. Well, they've actually mandated they have to get, come back in and put up with all the backlash that goes with it. As we can see from this film, though, maybe there is some ulterior motives for returning to the office. According to study after study, working from home leads to more efficient workers, less staff turnover, higher quality work, and it's cheaper for the business and its workers. So why the f do so many companies want people back into the office? The days of working from home are fading for more employees, now being called back to the office. Before COVID-19, high-tech companies were already experimenting with the advantages of remote work. A peer-reviewed report from an unidentified NASDAQ-listed company ran a trial where half of their call center workforce was randomly selected to work from home and the other half would remain in the office. The group, given the opportunity to work from home, had higher customer satisfaction, took 13% more calls, and suffered 50% less staff attrition, which is a big issue for call centers, which typically struggle with high staff turnover. A follow-up study done on workers in a wider selection of roles, including finance, marketing, and software development, had similar results. They compared staff working full-time from the office with staff working hybrid schedules from home and the office. That study found that hybrid workers were 8% more efficient at their jobs and had turnover rates 35% lower than staff working in the office full time. If businesses want to get the most out of their workers, the results are clear. More work from home is more better. Working from home is also cheaper for the business. Companies that want all of their workers in the office will pay more for utilities like electricity, maintenance, security, and internet that workers would happily provide themselves if they were allowed to work from home. It's rare that companies turn down better results for less money. But in this case, there are four reasons that more are demanding their staff come back into the office. The first reason is that a lot of companies are not doing so well right now. Interest rates are high, investors are not throwing money around like they were in 2020, and companies need to make cuts. The easiest and largest ongoing expense for most companies are their employees. If a business is getting less work than usual, laying off staff is a prudent business decision. If a business can cut expenses at the same rate as lost revenue, then it may be able to maintain profits to keep the shareholders happy. If a business is making less revenue, then it also means there's less work to do, so it just won't need as many staff. 
The problem is that laying off staff signals to the market that the company is struggling, which can affect the share price, make it harder to generate new business, and make it harder to hire new staff in the nope. future. Nobody wants to work for a company that lays off a lot of people on a whim, and customers don't want to work with a company that looks like it might go out of business. What companies really need is a way to get rid of staff without formally laying them off. Business leaders have already seen the studies, and they know that forcing people to work from the office leads to higher staff turnover, which in this case is exactly what they want. Now, it's also important to say that uh, working in the office is also important for new talent coming in. So I mentioned earlier that Generation Z has come into the workforce now. Now, they typically learn from their colleagues, so it's, it, it's the interaction in the office that's quite important here. So can you imagine uh, coming in as an intern, doing work experience or coming in as a new starter where some of your staff aren't there five days a week and um, you have to go home and you interact with them on video conference and you're kind of self-directed. Now at that stage of your career, you do need a little bit of guidance and coaching and you know just keeping an eye on you. So that's the bit I kind of worry about with hybrid working. Where does that happen? How does that happen? Now with like all good things, all these initiatives, it is good management you need to make this work, to make sure that people are developed, they're looked after, there's regular contact, they're productive, and they can be monitored as such to make sure that the company is getting what it wants, the employee is getting their development, and they've got a clear path ahead for growth and promotion. So that is absolutely super important. But the notion that working from home is a modern thing is certainly rebunked in this film. F International is a multi-million pound computer systems house with more than 600 freelance operators. You won't find many of them here at the Chesham head office though, because most of the people at the sharp end of the job work from home. Linda English works for F International as a computer programmer. She has a modern, well-equipped kitchen, two children and a bubble memory terminal. The final act of writing a computer program is to send hundreds of lines of text to the computer you're programming. Linda can write and store the program she's working on at times most convenient to her, when the children are asleep or at school. When the job is done, the computer's only a phone call away. Linda is in the forefront of perhaps the biggest revolution for working mothers since the pill. The office and the home is rather like having your cake and eating it. So what do you think about hybrid and home working? Now, I am very conscious, and I mentioned this quite a few times in this video, there's lots of trades where you can't work from home, and I'm very lucky as an office worker to have that particular option. So I recognise anybody that had to work through the pandemic and still has no option for home working. But if you are an office worker, what do you think about the way forward with the balance of home and work? And how do we make sure that we develop young people and ensure they grow and thrive? That's certainly very key. So as ever, if you'd like to reach out to me at 360timmy.com with any suggestions, please feel free to go there. It's got all my links to social media and email. Also, if you'd like to like and subscribe, that certainly helps the channel. And as ever, you have a super day.